Today I have the incredible Esme James with us, also known as the Kinky History TikTok lady, um, and we are going to discuss kinky history today. Um, I'm so excited to have you on my little baby podcast. <laughs> I am you. so excited to be here. This is um, absolutely <laughs> wonderful. I think it's a collaboration that needed to happen. I'm absolutely. so excited to be chatting. Yes, and so exciting to have two Australians as yes. well. Like, the odds, what are the odds? Absolutely. I mean, it's always when I came across your account and I was like, okay, incredible, empowered woman, talking about history, talking about sexuality, and then I went onto your account and it was like Queensland. I'm like, that never happens. No, it never happens. <laughs> never happens. And to only have a one-hour difference yes. in trying to organise a conference call, never happens usually it's like okay if i wake up at 4 a.m <laughs> absolutely you know, not having to wake um, up in the middle of the night for this interview is especially good <laughs> so, exactly, exactly. <laughs> um so let's start by you introducing you how did you get into this incredibly interesting field of study well um sex history here we go um yeah. so i've uh, I'm currently uh, in the middle of my PhD at the moment, and um, I spend a lot of time uh, teaching around literature surrounding sexuality at the university. Um, and my really fun tidbit is that when I initially came bright-eyed to university at the age of 18, um, I was fully prepared to study the history of religion. Um, so I've oh, done a big wow. job. <laughs> Isn't that insane? Although, in saying that, that is so closely correlated. Yes. Which we can get into. Like, I mean, I um, myself am very interested in theology and religion and kind of how that impacts. Well, it's impacted what? Everything, basically. <laughs> so that is so fascinating. Um, and I, I think it's really interesting that you said that about how closely they are related because they yeah. are. Um, yeah. And that's how I kind of managed to um, move over a little bit more to uh, studying like the history of sexuality um, yeah. and in particular um, my kind of area that at least I'm writing my thesis on is on the history of pornography yeah, um, and it's wow. also closely tied to um, how religion has impacted uh, you know politics and everything during the time that yeah. impacts our conversation around sex um, yeah, so absolutely th th that that's how I did it uh, it was religion yeah. it brought me here <laughs> <laughs> and like personally that is such an interesting topic for myself i actually my last podcast episode was just like the generalized history of christianity mm. um because of like how intertwined religion is with everything mm -hmm. um and yeah it's like you know i often will um throughout all history ancient history you'll always see like fertility um gods or fertility rights that they did and it's like that's interesting praying to like the gods or god to allow you to have babies but what about the what about the sex 101 like like no, it, it's so interesting because there is just so many uh, cross correlations, even back from like the ancient world, like not even exclusive to Christianity, but like sex and spirituality are just like almost yin and yang a lot of the yeah. time in history. Um, and I think when you're studying one, you kind of learn a lot about the other along the way. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, that's so fascinating. And obviously, like um, you'd have suppression in some cultures, but then like glorification mm. of sexuality and the others like yeah tell me about like what, what have been like your favorite topics or favorite sort of cultures thus far that you've sort of studied um it's very hard to pick a favorite but um one of my favorite things in terms of like the, the this difference between which cultures are really liberal about how they view sex and the ones that are more conservative um something i find really fascinating is looking at like the timeline because it's always a kickback once you have a liberal society it will either be overtaken or um you know kind of merged into the conservative one and it's very very cyclical i think when you like look at it long enough everything about history and our conversation around sex is cyclical and we're yeah, currently yeah 
going in the other way. We're like on the rise of becoming really liberal and progressive again. But, yeah. you know, part of that conversation is that we are becoming really liberal and really progressive. And we forget that in other times in history, we've also been liberal and progressive. Yes, 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 yes absolutely. absolutely. It's, it's funny, funny um, at the moment, like, like on TikTok, TikTok we're discussing, discussing ancient Greeks. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I, I had posted a video about just a joke, you know, you do a couple of little joke <laughs> ones. About how, um, like a lot of the Spartan men, well, pretty much all throughout ancient Greece, uh, homosexual intercourse was absolutely just a normal part of every day. It wasn't taboo whatsoever. And, um, I have a lot of comments. People were just being shocked. They didn't know that. Yeah. Um, and it is interesting to see. And that obviously that's not the only case. It's that, yeah, that, um, that loop, I suppose we start like Epicurean, uh, sorry, we start like kind of stoicish and then we get to this Epicurean. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, that's so interesting. I never really sort of thought about it. It's great. Uh, and ancient Greece yeah. is always a fun one. Like I feel like any conversation about ancient Greece is always going to go down well. <laughs> what a time. hundred um, percent. Do, do you kind of come across like, how do you find people sort of when you explain, you know, this is your area of expertise and how you're studying, how do people generally take it? Like, what is, so, like in an academic sense, yeah, what do people react to it like? It's really interesting because especially uh, first kind of going into academia as, you know, like an, a, an emerging young academic, I really expected a big kickback. I expected yeah. a lot of like very kind of undermining um, snarky comments or any of that. Um, and I have been so surprised um, that I just haven't experienced any of that. People oh, are wow. fascinated. And that's uh, fantastic. I think what the, the great thing about it, and maybe it is because we are in this kind of uh, open conversation state of society at the moment, but sexuality is such a huge part of being human um and it's weirder to not talk about it um and especially when it comes to academia um we've got a huge gap if we are studying the history of humanity or just uh, any kind of doesn't matter what field you are and you erase sex from the conversation it's not possible um so it's really wonderful and it's been very um I've been very, very fortunate that it's been very, like, highly thought of and I've been really well supported throughout. Um, that being said, you always have that bit of anxiousness every time you, like, introduce your uh, topic at, like, a little uh, fancy dinner, um, being like, oh, you're studying uh, uh, neurobiology chemicals and I'm just like, oh, wait, um, so it's porn? Um, I read <laughs> porn. Um, <laughs> Amazing. That's so funny. Um, I love what you said, like, you just can't erase sexuality from the conversation. How has it been in an academic standpoint mm-hmm. trying to research something that there is that gap? Like how do you go about that when – how do you find what you need to find? It's very surprising because there has been a lot of scholars who have kind of done this work. Some of it, um, you know, becomes bestsellers for a while and then other ones just kind of go and go unheard um, yeah. because there's not a lot of, uh, like, subjects at the university that might offer that kind of conversation or um, any kind of reason like that. Um, but there has been scholars doing this work quite continually. Um, there's a really uh, fantastic uh, scholar called Hayley uh, Leberman who recently, not recently, but a few years ago released her PhD and it was the first PhD on like the history of sex toys. And oh, it's just wow. amazing. And she released it into this kind of, you know, mainstream accessible book called like Buzz, the History of Sex Toys. And, oh, cool. and I think that's a great example of someone who's kind of, you know, done the work for the first time and and, you know, people in the field know her, know her, and then other people might just see her in a bookstore. And I think that's great. Gotcha. Absolutely. That's that is fascinating. fascinating. I'm going to have to go and find that book. And I love the title too. That's hilarious. It's so good. <laughs> I think the cover is like a clitoris. It's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> that's so interesting. Actually, yeah. That. And have you found, like, um, like when we're talking – Obviously, I saw your video the other day when, uh, was it Henry VIII or maybe not? Some maybe Victorian era, I can't remember. <laughs> and that apparatus that oh, you the chair. were showing. Yeah, the chair. <laughs> like, 
is that a big part of it? Like just finding things and being like, oh, wait, this was actually used for sex, not for, I don't know, whatever else, a torture device. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's wonderful because you have examples like that. And there's also, you know, the fantastic uh, history of sex, which I think is based in New York. I could be wrong there. That has a kind of collection of all of these incredible items throughout history. And I think when we see that and we see these objects and we see these pieces of furniture, which people basically have in their like Christian Grey style red room of pain and then yeah. members of the monarchy, um, I think it's yeah. a really great reminder that <laughs> our desires and our behaviours really haven't changed over time. And it doesn't matter if you're like the king on the hill or, you know, you're, you're, you're the medieval peasant, like they're, they're there, they're part of who, like being human. Um, and it definitely opens up a conversation surrounding uh, more like non-normative sexual practices. Yeah, yes, yeah. Uh, it's so funny, hey, how we, uh, sorry, my like ochre is starting to come out. <laughs> Um, it happens to Australians on a podcast. <laughs> um, what was I going to say? I was going to say, it, it, so today we obviously have this like quote unquote normal normative, mm -hmm. right? Um, woman, man, procreate. Where, like, where did we get that from? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I mean, again, it's like, it's very interesting, and this is me coming back to my uh, I'll die on a hill, history is cyclical argument. Um, yeah. But you go back to even the 17th century Europe, and in terms of, like, normal sexual behaviour, um, there's, a you know, a, a lot of evidence that up until then uh, sexual initiation for young men, like boys on the cusp of that kind of 14, 18 range, how they were sexually initiated was not with a woman. Um, yeah, okay. And so they would kind of, they almost still had these Greek practices that it would be an older man that you kind of first get with at that age and that's your, like, yeah, you're a man now. Um even in the 1700s that's fascinating yeah we're talking like like 17th century london here like it's not that far yeah. removed um but it's around that time uh that we see a huge uh swap in our mentalities toward homosexuality uh there's a fantastic uh scholar called uh i believe his name is rudolf uh turnback who writes about this really really well uh perhaps i'll probably send you the name because i my pronunciation yeah, right. off the top of my head is oh. terrible <laughs> But it, I think that's a really fantastic example of that was considered absolutely normal. A homosexual practice initiating you into the heterosexual world. And from then on in, like your sexual practice with your wife and everything, you know, it was still perfectly accepted that, but if not, you know, polite, um, that you would continue your homosexual relations with other men as you grew older because you had to initiate the next boys. Like, yeah. Right. It's very that's, Greece. <laughs> so interesting. Yeah. And I absolutely did not realize. I I knew this would this would have this happened in ancient mm. Greece. I knew that. Um, I had no idea it was taking place in the 1700s. Yeah. So I, I like all I want to do is ask what, <laughs> what, like how, like what was the initiation? Like what did that include? Um, I, I look, I, I think it's that very uh, ancient Greek uh, conversation of, uh, prob you know, definitely wouldn't happen in today's society kind yeah. of deal. Um, but I think there was uh, around that same time you had a lot of um, kind of idolization of ancient Greek practices and a lot of uh, kind of okay. like libertine um, societies there, which I think were connected to that. Um, but, you know, it is like that, that sexual initiation, whatever uh, the call of that. Yeah, yeah, interesting. interesting. And then also, also alongside, alongside that, especially, especially like, you know, 1700 yeah. London, yeah. <laughs> it was it, like this very constricting Christian lifestyle, mm. right, where sex was viewed as sin a lot of the time and that it was also taking place. I wonder how, like, in how they um, – how did they get their, their morality <laughs> around that? That's so – 
weird to me. <laughs> it's uh, it's really fascinating. And this is kind of why uh, my area of focus is around that 17th, 18th century turn, because a lot happens in our mentality. Um, and especially towards homosexuality, we see this kind of giant reconfiguration of what it means to be man and woman at that time, which comes from, you know, Christian teachings becoming more dominant in um, in part of like politic, um, political conversation and everything like that. Yeah. Um, and part of that was uh, this connection starts to emerge that sex with another man makes you effeminate and degenerate. And they, you know, started to actually prosecute homosexuality quite heavily. Yeah. Um, and you have this quite intense period of, you know, fear um, over the next a uh, few hundred years, you know, you look at like the Oscar Wilde trials or something yeah. like that, where homosexuality becomes this like persecuting sin because they saw that it was um, really a threat to the the mum dad family that they wanted to establish. Gotcha. That's so interesting, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, today we obviously are aware of what our LGBTQI plus society and friends um have gone through but to know that that's really only a what two three hundred year old idea is absolutely stunning absolutely. Um, and like, it's scary it becomes ingrained so quickly that, that exactly like that's a blip on the historical timeline you yes, know absolutely wow, have no idea that that took place I, I also wonder as well if like like you know, obviously in the 1700s, if that's taking place, when do you see and in your study, have, where was that flip? Was there like a certain person, a pope, or like how did we kind of go from this is the normal uh, male experience mm -hmm. to be initiated as a man to homosexual people must be, you know, put in jail? How, how, I, like how did that work? I think there's a few factors that were going on at the time and um kind of connecting this with like the sale of sex toys which was Ooh. at the time sold openly at markets um in london um there, there's some fantastic engravings of you know women going to buy their like a wooden headed phallic dildo bird thing yeah, right. at the time and there's an importation ban on sex toys at the end of the 17th century around where homosexuality is also becomes um uh, um, uh, more highly prosecuted yeah. um and uh, it's interesting because the sex toys isn't based on uh christian uh influence or anything like that it was based on the fact uh well it's based on almost like racial divide um it had to do with the fact that um a lot of uh the toys at the time were being manufactured in italy um and spain um and so they began to be referred to as senior dildo um and there was this uh fear that uh, the Spanish lover, as in the the, the dildo, was going to be superior to the English man, um, and so they they banned them. Um, and it has a lot more to do with like almost English male insecurity than anything else. <laughs> so white men <laughs> were insecure about a Spanish dildo. <laughs> yes. There's this, like, and it's really funny because I, I can't I explain any better than that. Like, that is what yeah, happened. Wow. And there's yeah. all of these, like, poems from the time, like uh, Thomas Nash writes uh, the Merry Ballad of Nash's Dildo, and it's all about um, him going to find his lover but finding that she uh, is more satisfied with the dildo and so, like, humiliates him by, like, getting off in front of him. And it's all in, like, Shakespearean little, like, yeah. rhyming couplets and stuff. But yeah. that was a genuine, like, fear at the time. And um, they were becoming this combination of, uh, you know, uh, national fear and everything kind of just builds up um, with the connection of how uh, Christianity um, was kind of coming into politics and they really wanted to clean up the house and all of that. Um, and there's this, like, stress on that teaching about sexuality begins in the household um, and you don't learn it externally anymore. Um, so it's a lot of things happening <laughs> and they're funny. <laughs> Yeah, that's hilarious. Because I would have just thought 100% religion. That yeah. would have been what 
that's like the best, the funniest thing I've ever heard. It was just that they were intimidated by an inanimate object. Senior dildo. Pushing themselves more than they could. Honestly, if you want to laugh, look at some of like the poems and ballads that have been written about dildos at the time by men. They are so funny. They are so funny. I'm gonna have, I'm absolutely gonna, I will look that up. (laughs) It's great. Yeah, yeah. And I think it's so funny because, like, even like now, history is cyclical. Um, that argument about like that, the, the, the feeling of like, um, emasculation that still kind of exists around sex toys, I think. Yes, yes. No, I can totally, from personal experience in the past, (laughs) I've known. Yes. I have known a lot of guys hold that sentiment. Thank goodness not in my current relationship, but yeah. in the past, yeah, a lot of guys still, I believe, um, are intimidated, which I, is uh, obviously not a new concept. We've been having that for hundreds ages. of years now. Honestly, I think it's a really fantastic idea on, like, a first day whenever, you know, you're having the first bedroom experience. Just open the drawer. Just sense the vibe. I think that's a really good test of a relationship. Like, is this yeah. worth it? Like, are, you, are you intimidated or are you excited? Are, are you open to the possibility? Like, are you feeling bad that it's a pink giant? Like, what's the feeling yeah. here? Yeah. <laughs> Which I suppose now, like, where my mind's going now, it opens up that conversation of okay so in the 1700s women um we obviously knew what we were doing uh, Mm -hmm. or at least some of us did now i believe and correct me if i'm wrong but especially that like uh sort of 1800s forward Mm -hmm. we see like the woman in at least in our like westernized culture lose that understanding of their own body is Mm. that something that you've come across like in your in your research I think it's um an interesting combination of um that this conversation about female sexuality becoming quite erased during that period um and I always say that a fantastic example of that is around like the myth of how the vibrator was invented because we have that you know like common misconception that it was uh designed because doctors were masturbating women uh because they were hysterical and that's why they needed a vibrator and that's such a like commonly held misconception where you know what really happened was that this vibrator was invented um and that was, you know, made to cure men. Like it was made for men oh. and it was made to cure impotence and their pain and uh, their earache and all of these kind of things. Um, and even, you know, when it started to become a home appliance and given to women, you know, it, it was specifically said like, don't put this anywhere near this region because they will oh. become uh, <laughs> a bit too happy. Um, and that's not the point of the cure. Um, and then come 1960s, Betty Dodson was like, hey, vibrators, like women, get get on them. Um, yeah, right. And I think it has to do a lot with how we've then retold history because this story has come around that vibrators were made uh, and invented for hysterical women. Um, and while that, like, story is kind of funny and cheeky, it does something where it basically erases women's sense of, like, autonomy or, like, sexual awareness. Yeah. We yeah. kind of have this image that of, like, women as these, like, like brain-dead creatures being yeah. taken to the doctors and just being masturbated and being like okay that was great um like it's just um i think it's very um it's that classic like history uh belongs in the 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 the, the, the oh, what's what's the saying like history belongs to the conqueror or that yes yes absolutely and so we have like yeah like, like male sexuality, sexuality and pleasure, pleasure was talked about but mm-hmm. female's sexuality and pleasure absolutely just out the window it just didn't exist <laughs> it's funny this morning i follow like a bunch of meme pages like yeah and this is so unacademic but i love it <laughs> and the meme this morning i saw it was like in the in 1840s um a woman who in the past year has had four babies zero orgasms and is crying all the time <laughs> male doctor she must be mad yeah <laughs> You know, I guess that, yeah, like, like do we even we know that we were capable of pleasure? Like, do, is, is, there, it, is there, is there like, sorry, let me rephrase. Is, do, did women know that 
they were capable of pleasure or are, are we literally saying that for hundreds of years we just literally had babies and that's it yeah and it's it's just like absurd when you think that we kind of believe that like no historical woman like had a little roaming hand at any stage like Like, was it maybe like suppressed on purpose by the women like don't (laughs) you know but this is what we do um i mean i always find it quite funny because i mean uh, my primary uh, primary area of research as i said is uh pornography and yeah. part of that is i read a lot of dialogues um from like 1600s and everything that are about you know young women kind of discovering uh they can give themselves pleasure for the first time in like the 1600s yeah. and yeah. like reading about that and how like broadly sexually aware women and the conversation around sex was so a lot of these you know plays and dialogues are written by men and what i always find so fascinating in them is that men today could learn so much from wow. these like papers from the 16 1700s uh yeah. where you know the the guy is explaining for the first time like how to do sex and he's like oh if she can't get off that way like put a pillow under her and reposition and all of this kind of stuff and I'm like where is this gone where is this gone and conversations about like not not just finding the clitoris like that's where we are today yes. but how to properly pleasure the clitoris which is not like rubbing it right on it like all of this stuff so so you're, <laughs> sorry sorry you're telling me <laughs> so you're telling me in the 1600s yes men knew what they were doing sex wise yeah. I, I'm saying woman. if you want to get with a man, find one from uh, 1658. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. <laughs> like I've read a document from there. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I had no idea. I just, my perception was that, yeah, all like history, you know, from, I don't know, maybe like the Romans forward. <laughs> yeah, we just had no idea. No. That was- <laughs> I guess that was something I just have never even thought about. No, I find it a really good accessible one uh, for anyone to go and find, uh, which is pretty well in publication, is one called uh, Memoirs of a Woman of Pleasure, um, otherwise known as Fanny Hill, written in 1747. And in it, uh, it's written by a man, John Cleveland, uh, but he writes about the experiences of a female prostitute working in London. And some of the moments that happen in that, like the pillow thing does happen in that, but even other things, like at one stage, she's kind of like cheating on her master at the time. But, um, you know, she knows how to cover it up because, um, you know, she will have had a bit of swelling because she's only just uh, uh, c- c- conceived, um, um, c- con- conceived, c- consummated, that one of those C words. <laughs> Plenty of C's. <laughs> And so everything's a bit wet, red and kind of swollen. So she knows that, you know, she can't see the next man straight away. She knows that she's got to go pee before the next guy comes in. Like all of this stuff. Like to avoid a UTI or to like, they yes. just tidbits that you have to kind of, your mum has, has to tell you today. Or yeah. Well, I mean, we've got the internet now, so it's less known. Of, like, no. less, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but I always just found it so interesting because I was like, okay, putting it in perspective, this guy knew enough about like how the female body works Mm -hmm. and has clearly talked to the women in his life before writing this about like what happens to you after sex that um, and you know, like those conversations today, uh, they are a a dime a dozen. Absolutely. Like, I think if, if, uh, I think if a boy doesn't grow up in a household with sisters or a mother, that's probably really open. Like I have plenty of friends now, this, given I grew up in a very, um, Christian community, um, in my childhood, but I have friends who had all brothers and literally didn't know about periods. Like just like that didn't know how it worked. I remember one of my friends was like, so once you get a period, you just leave forever? Like, is that how, like, they just had no concept. Leave forever. They had no idea, you know? Um, and that was in, like, 2000s, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you know, yeah, it was cute. But anyway, I, I think we've got, we've got kids now, so, you know, he obviously just put two and two together. <laughs> oh, my golly. I find that... Yeah, sorry. No, no, you go, you go. 
I was just saying, like, maybe add it to our dating advice. Not only, you know, flash a guy um, your dildos on the first date, but maybe, like, question him on how my, um, menstruation works and yes. see what his answer yes. is. Yes. Like, Please, you know, like, put a picture of, like, maybe, like, a menstrual cup or something and be like, what was it used for? And if they say, like, to unplug a toilet, then, you know, <laughs> Maybe ask exactly how much comes out um, of us yes. every month. And yes. uh... <laughs> exactly, I, I still remember like, like my, my partner, partner now. He um he has, has much younger siblings, siblings, but when, when we, we sort of first started being together, together and, and he, he saw like my, I think it was like the first period that he saw me having, mm. and he was like, "Oh my gosh, are you hurt? Are you okay?" Is <laughs> like just. Just like, like, do we need to go to a doctor? Like, <laughs> like yeah, man, this happens every month. And like, I'm okay. <laughs> I just want to make sure you're fine, you know, like completely flabbergasted. I love right. it. I always love those like um, social experiments where they put like the, the pain generators on yes. uh, men. Yeah. yeah. I always find them really amusing because it also kind of reminds me. I'm like, yeah, we are really strong, actually. Oh, God. <laughs> 100%. I remember... So so, um, not to blabber on about myself, but I almost died in childbirth with my first daughter. Oh my and god! Was rushed into a C-section and all of that. Yeah, and I still remember the overwhelming thought that I could not get over is women are warriors. Like, I just, <laughs> like I, I used to hold this concept of childbirth and pregnancy and all of that as like mm-hmm. la la la, you know, like this yeah. is a lovely little thing, like have a cute chubby baby, blah blah blah. Yeah. Um, no, no, it's war. It's like <laughs> it's war. It's, it's war. It's savage, and it is hard. Yeah. War. And our bodies are freaking phenomenal. Like absolutely, yeah. Just like the evolution of what I mean, and I always find that really interesting in the discussion of like how women are, you know, made to be so concerned about the looks. But okay, so that's bad enough as it is. Then put on the absolute like transformation that the woman's body oh. is capable of. Exactly. It's insane. Exactly. I, and I, then, I, like, like then, then we have this culture, culture like, like you, of course, course being on TikTok, TikTok, me being on TikTok, TikTok at the moment. moment. What is trending, trending is these men saying things <laughs> like, oh, if my wife gets fat during childbirth, I'll tell her to whip it in shape. Yeah. And they just, they just have no idea. Like nope. what a woman's body actually goes through in nine months from her literally having nothing to her body producing a human being. Yeah. Any, any partner of someone that's witnessed that happen and witnessed childbirth would give no shits about no. a stretch mark. And they would let a woman take as, as much, much time, time and, and probably, probably not even have expectations of them. Of that. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I find it, I think it's really good that at the moment we are having this like trend of really showing these like alpha male podcasters really for what they are. And yeah. I think one of my favorite things is that there's this conversation um, going around about like how homoerotic it is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I totally agree. Like, the thing is, is, and I might be, this may not be completely politically correct, and I hope it's, it is correct. Anyway, <laughs> like, if we didn't have this, this historical shame mm-hmm. that unfortunately has, still, is still very much around, around homosexuality, mm-hmm. would these men that seem so, um, uninterested in the female body and what it is would yeah. they maybe have more freedom to explore their homosexuality you know like absolutely and i, I think like there's, there's, there's a huge argument there and i think it's also you know backed up by some fantastic research as well that a lot of like very very hyper performances of masculinity yes. to the detriment of like hating women and yeah. idolizing the male man a lot of that can be due to this kind of like repressed homosexuality um yeah. and and so I think there is a, a, a case where, you know, when I see that more than anything else, well, more than feeling frightened for them, uh, frightened by them or whatever they expect of me, you do feel genuinely sorry for them. Absolutely. And at the moment, like I said, we're doing a lot of Greek stuff on my channel and talking about the Spartans and the Spartan <laughs> men who arguably, like throughout history, must have been some of the fittest, most mm-hmm. 
quote unquote alpha of all the men in like their <laughs> training <laughs> regiment started from the age of seven. Yeah. And if they died from their training, too bad, so sad you weren't strong enough. Yeah. Um, and the male body was glorified. They'd oil themselves up before war. They would have intercourse with one another. And homosexuality was just completely accepted. Absolutely. Because after war, imagine, imagine your fight or flight response, right? <laughs> imagine you know, in, in a, a in a literal hand to hand combat, how high your hormones, your adrenaline must be. You got to get that out somehow. <laughs> you know what I mean? And for some men, that was to have sexual intercourse. And in the barracks, there was nothing else but dudes. You know, so we could actually put forward an argument that throughout history, um, that some of the most absolutely alpha, hyper performance male stereotypes mm -hmm. did perform homosexual acts. Absolutely. I, I love that. I, I wouldn't say it's fight or flight then. I think it would be flight or fuck. Like that's oh. what we're going here. <laughs> I love that. That's funny. I think it's great though. I, I mean, because I think that the, there's a point where, you know, performances of like hyper masculinity as well, it's rooted in so much fear. It's rooted in fear of like not being good enough. It's rooted in fear of, you know, doing the wrong thing and everything. Um, and there's so much strength in being open to sexuality yeah. and being open to exploration and everything. Um, and it's, I think we underestimate still today, or at least a lot of people do, how much courage it takes for people in uh, a society still rooted in so much fear for some people to be so open about their identity and sexuality just on a day-to-day -day basis absolutely I, I, and I completely agree with that you know I've had um it, even it was really eye-opening to me obviously I am a straight mostly white woman yeah. <laughs> and so I when, when you, you experience and I'm sure you probably had experiences on being so present online mm. um uh, it, it was actually the penis video that I did on the on the Greek statues, and I had so many trans men in my comments like, <laughs> like I'm the perfect man. I thought it was hilarious. Yeah, I saw those comments actually. Yeah, I love them. Like, <laughs> like I thought that was so great. And then um, even in my comment section, there was about like ten people I had to block because yeah. they were, like they, they were nastily, nastily commenting back. back. And, and I know I that seems a little insignificant probably to a trans person because that's, that's their day-to-day, -day, you know. But yeah. for me, as someone who considers themselves as an ally to that community, yeah. I was just, like, absolutely appalled that that was that taking place in my comment section, you know. Absolutely. And there's so much work that does go into kind of moderating your own comment section. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I'm sure you, like, probably felt exactly the same, but as soon as I see someone who's, like, made one of those comments and a kind of argument's taking place, I always monitor those really closely. I'm like, okay, when's the point where they're having a conversation, trying to yes. educate one another? And where's the point it's just getting nasty? Okay, now I'm going to remove exactly. that comment. I, I, um, I do the exact same thing. I feel like a third-party, like, bystander, yeah. which is, like... <laughs> Do, and typically it's just debating back and forth about yeah. like, whatever but yeah if it's ever like an attack to like one of my followers i'm like Bloch. yeah <laughs> um, that's it and then you always have the comment i always put it there i was like by the way guys like i blocked that person you know no one's coming into this family i'm bringing like this hatred <laughs> like i want to be a safe space you know um, no. and there's a big difference like a few times i've done that and then you know uh, someone else has come they've read the argument and then they've kind of accused me of silencing the yeah. other party and i was like no 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 i'm i'm will silence any party that is just throwing around hatred and no reason yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely yeah as, yeah, as you know it's an interesting, interesting thing as well and i mean especially because your your um, page is specifically about sexuality too mm. i can imagine that you would get that quite a lot mm. yeah. yeah i always i i call it the weeding out videos wherever I make an explicitly like um, LGBTQ plus yeah. video and allyship or even like talking about my back bisexuality. And then I just watch the comments and I'm like, you're gone, you're gone, you're gone. Like <laughs> No, that's so, it just, yeah, it's interesting. Uh, it's so, so I was going to ask before actually, before, just rewinding back. Mm -hmm. you work about um, Franny, what was it? Fr the oh, Fanny Hill. Fanny, Fanny Hill. Hill. So, so do you, do you know, know much, much about, about um, like, like the history of sex, sex work? work and like mm -hmm. obviously today there's a huge amount of people that um, 
are either against sex workers or, you know, there's a taboo that a lot of people hold around sex work. Mm -hmm. What, what does the history show us in that field? Well, I mean, the history shows that it's one of the oldest professions of all time. And it's one that has lasted through the ancient times until now. Uh, There is on, I think, one hand or two hands, that many professions that have carried through. Like, you have your doctors, yeah. you'll have your lawyers, you'll have your teachers, and you have your sex workers. Yeah. Um, so and so, true. and I think it's really interesting because, you know, sure, back in ancient times there, um, I, you can't say that they were, like, fully well respected if they were more part of the community than here. But I find that it's still fascinating that i mean let's take australia for example um sex work didn't come over in victoria um under you know the conditions for work safety or even in the pandemic they kind of forgot sex work when they were making the rules and everything yeah and it's still this idea that like oh yeah i guess you guys are a career no (laughs) they've been around for every single society and they've made it there is clearly a need um and you know that it's such a valid form of work that it's so Absolutely. weird that we haven't been able to get our head around it. Yeah, <laughs> that's also so fascinating. I, what was it? Do you know, like in the 1700s, obviously that book mm-hmm. you were referring to talks about the adventures of a sex worker. Mm-hmm. Um, was that, do you think, a societal, because the society was more respectful of sex workers or do you think it was just that this individual kind of had a good insight to it? No, there was, there's a lot of, um, there was a lot of, uh, brothels and, uh, ha- um, madam houses, um, around London at the time. Like, I think, uh, uh, forgive me if I'm wrong, but I think just like in the center of London, there was kind of like 11 main ones. And a lot of things were run by women, which is really yeah, interesting wow. as well. Um, yeah. you know, there's a fantastic figure called, uh, Teresa Berkeley, who I highly recommend looking up who was like a brothel madam um, and who run ran this like BDSM dungeon almost oh, wow. in like the middle of like covered gardens like she's incredible wow. um, and you know employed women and employed women of like all varieties as well yeah. to kind of cater to every taste and and um, there's sex work was still for a time that you know it was it, people knew that it was happening uh yeah. people knew yeah. that it was happening and it was one of those things where you kind of look the other way yeah. um a lot of shops um had like covers so that the, during the day the girls would like sit and almost like pretend to be knitting or doing work or something sure. at the front of the shop and then you know, down the back, that's um, come nighttime, yeah. that's where everything happens. Yeah, gotcha. And patrons could probably, like, during the day, be like, oh, yeah, this is what's on offer, maybe. And then, yeah, like, yeah. Well, because people would know that that's the shop. So you have the girls there. You're kind of, like, checking yeah. them out. And not just girls. There was guys as well yeah, working yeah, as sex workers yeah, during the time. Um, but I, I find it really interesting around that period of time. There's some fantastic work that's been done on like sex work during the time. Yeah. Um, because especially around like the, the, uh, I think France had a lot more of a, um, an acceptance of sex work yeah, around that same okay. time. That would um, make sense because of like notable, notable like, like historical, historical places, places that I'm thinking of that are probably yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Yeah, right. Gotcha. But there was definitely, um, I think French brothels had a lot of influence on how English brothels, you know, began to be run. And there was almost this, like, family environment to some of them, not all of them. There were some terrible uh, examples, but there is some, you know, fantastic ideas of, like, the respect that you show to um, the the the. Uh, sex worker that you're hiring and there was like rules of conduct um you know sometimes some of it's you know rumor or hearsay but you know there would be like little peepholes so the madam can kind of keep watch of what's happening in the room yeah, yeah. and mm-hmm. all of this kind of stuff um and you in all of these you also had like almost a bodyguard who was part oh, of the yeah. um i'm just ready to kick anyone out and yeah. i think that's just it's it's really fantastic and a re- really fascinating topic uh, looking at prostitution and sex work during that time. Um, not yeah. all of it's great, but we could definitely learn a lot from it. <laughs> yeah, instead of just pretending that it's not a very valid position, like a work position, you know, like, yeah, you know, not, like you said, sort of not even including it in <laughs> pandemic rules. That sort of, no. that, that kind, kind of, of like, like, yeah, obviously, obviously I don't, don't know like what the inside conversation conversation would have been but but she just just not even mention it 
sex workers must yeah. be unthought about, you know what I mean? And that's really sad. It's, it's um, crazy. And they had to post like a sec, a separate, um, you know, list of rules of like, you know, the roadmap and everything. Cause they'd forgotten yeah. about sex work. So like a few days later they published it and it was like, well, now you've kind of separated it from every other career. Everyone so else. this is even worse. Yes. <laughs> yes. They just like stuck, stuck their, their foot, foot in a hole and then just made it worse. Yeah. <laughs> That's about the Australian government to be honest. <laughs> um, yeah, but yeah. I find that. That's In a terms whole of, conversation. That's a whole, that's a whole other podcast episode. Exactly. So um, just in the last bit, why don't you tell us about your dissertation and mm-hmm. um, what, you're, what you're looking at now? So my, uh, so my official dissertation is looking at um, a certain form of like aesthetics of writing in erotic literature from 17th to like uh, – early 19th century right. so looking at things like fanny hill how it's written a lot of works of like uh le marquis de sade who was a very infamous um you know we get sadism from his name french writer okay and uh texts like venus in furs and coming back to that like religion argument um what i'm really looking at is how these texts kind of emulate this experience of like coming out of your body during sex and like feeling like mm-hmm. transcendent and uh, yeah. this kind of almost religious experience that happens via sex. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Like, that like that spiritual, spiritual aspect. aspect. And, and, and I've, I've read, read a lot of texts, texts that, that um, um, not, not historical, historical but, but contemporary, contemporary that, mm-hmm. that, that do, do, I think it was, was um, I forget her name, but the, the, the book the name is Pussy. <laughs> That's why. <what I'm laughs> yes, okay. And uh, whoever the author was, she, she writes, writes about that, that very sacred, sacred femininity and then, like, like that, that spiritual side, side of, of um, being within your sexual, sexual like, peak. Yeah. So that, that's super interesting that that yes. is kind of around. Sorry, it's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, but it's it's fascinating and, you know, part of uh, the work that I'm doing is tying the language used in all of these texts back to religious or um, writings on the sublime at the time because they do use all of those, like, you know, I was transported, I was out of my body, I was in a state of ecstasy um, mm. and it was it's the same language being used in yeah. both writings and there's a lot to be said about that, about the experience that um, sexuality actually has for us as humans And, you know, we know it plays more of a role than just conceiving children. Um, So when actually looking at what role that can be for us, we do have this, you know, um, biologically we do have this experience that makes us feel on on the edge of glory. Um, But what role does that play for us, you know, philosophically as well? Yeah, Yeah. how interesting. I I cannot cannot wait wait for the day to read your (laughs) dissertation. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) My channel is live. Um, No, that's that's really fascinating. I, I also maybe a little controversial, but I'd love to know your opinion on obviously historically. I assume um, erotic literature it was written or maybe drawn, mm-hmm. It, mm-hmm. and then versus today we have like HD video yeah. p- versions of pornography. I have heard a lot of studies about how uh, um, consuming too much visual pornography can impact the brain and all of that sort of stuff what's your kind of thoughts on that yeah thoughts on that well I mean when pornography emerged as like a defined genre which is around the 18th century um and just before that um you know it was used in a lot of political slander and it was also used in a lot of like medical texts and it was used in a a range of things and I think what's important about that is that we know that pornography has the ability to change your um, opinions and your emotions Mm. you know like pornography was used to kind of slander Marie Antoinette and you know create hatred towards the aristocracy hence the French Revolution so when we look at the role that pornography plays today and the fact that it is visual you don't get a unlike a book uh, uh and that imaginative element where mm-hmm. you can kind of decide what's happening and what's not happening when you have a visual um, indication and there is studies done that at the peak when you come to climax your brain's quite you know malleable to um different opinions and perceptions and that's an argument about where fetishes come from you know if you're at the edge of climax and you see a foot that maybe that's what um, brings it in yeah um, but something that i find is really important is 
that if that's the case, we don't have enough research to say it's the case, but you know, some compelling studies, we need to be more conscious consumers. And I think it's really important to kind of, um, invest and purchase your pornography ethically look at like filming companies that um you know even if like non-normative ones i'm thinking something like kink.com where when you're watching uh like the actual uh pornographic video before the scene play starts you'll see this conversation with the performer or performers about what's going to happen what they're comfortable with and then they go into the play Uh, and i for that consent consent aspect aspect. to be normalized yeah absolutely and i think that is so important and you know what um places that are just basically search engines for pornography like uh, Pornhub and X Hamster or all of those kind of things and they have problems already like big problems obviously um ethically legal and legally legally. like I follow um I follow a page that that, uh uh, is suing suing Pornhub Pornhub. Mm -hmm. um, for a lot of uh uh, and and I I believe believe, I don't know the details details, but, but not, not everything, everything on those, those free pornography, pornography sites, sites that you, that watch, you watch are willing, willing participants. No, no, um, absolutely. And that is, that a, is scary a scary thing. thing. That's no, so scary. absolutely. And I, and I think that's one of the reasons um, that, I mean, I encourage everyone that I can to pull away from them and also, you know, direct to more. Um, if, if, if the porn's free, it's fair to say that it, you shouldn't be watching it. Like, um, okay. Um, no. So, I mean, not all of them. There's a few ethical, fantastic ethical pornography sites where um, they'll just play an advert and that's how they generate their revenue and stuff like that. Yeah. But um, searching them up, there's plenty out there and a lot of um, fantastic, like, woman-run uh, pornography sites as okay, well, which yeah. are always great to support. So, yeah. yeah interesting. interesting. Oh, that's so that's good so to know good because that's, 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 a, that's, that's a, I, I, I read a lot of spicy, spicy books. That's my <laughs> Love. <laughs> even that's really good to know so yeah, yeah. i like that so that's if it's free so you probably shouldn't be watching it great pay for your porn <laughs> that's a great little um slogan and i was also going to say um it's interesting i i caved and i ended up watching euphoria because it's trending at the moment <laughs> TV gal. I like books uh, more, um, but I watched it. And in one of the very first scenes, it's a young, like maybe 17, 18 year old boy having like intercourse for the first time and kind of going from zero to a hundred because that's what he'd seen in porn. Yeah. Um, and how, how re- uh, that scene kind of just t- took me back. And I was mm-hmm. watching it with my sister-in-law and I was like, Oh my gosh, today there are this whole generation of boys and girls who are technically virgins, but mm-hmm. they are, have been exposed to hardcore pornography. Yeah. What on earth is going to happen there? You know, like, absolutely. Are we going to need to, like, what are we going to do about that? You know? I think that's one of those um, fantastic arguments for why we need to talk about sexuality a lot more. Absolutely. And because if you're having those conversations, then you can direct to more ethical um, sources and to a more yeah. ethical um, relationships and everything like that. It's all part of talking. Absolutely. Absolutely. No, fascinating, yeah, fascinating, fascinating, fascinating stuff. stuff. Um, um, any last, Any last topics, topics you feel like you, you must, must get out get before out. we close up? No, I think this has been absolutely fantastic. I have just yeah. had a blast talking. <laughs> well, I definitely, if you're willing, want to get you back. There's probably like millions of micro topics we could cover. Um, I agree. <laughs> You can find Esme on um, TikTok. What is your TikTok handle? Is it your name? Uh, esme.louise with an extra e on the end um okay, that's the perfect. same for instagram uh, i'll post i'll be posting videos on there with you so they can probably find you <laughs> um, and uh, what are your and instagram as well do you have a youtube i do have a youtube a youtube too so if you like what you hear go <laughs> esme. i saw that you were about to, you were going to launch a mini series with your mum. I am. I am. We're really excited about that. Uh, Sex Statistics, which looks at uh, the sex and stats in Australia. um, And that is coming out very, very soon. Uh, So really excited about that one. Yay. Yay. Well, it has been an absolute absolute pleasure pleasure to both meet you and chat. Um, Absolutely. Right back at you. Yeah. And can't wait to have you back, hopefully, in the future. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks, everyone, for listening. And uh, we'll see you next episode. Thanks.